One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you might have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. May God deepen our understanding of these words. going to try to see if this is on. <laughs> I can just take this one. Let me just take this one out. Thank you for having me and here today. And hello to everybody on Zoom. Why don't you all turn around and wave to the people on Zoom so they know you're welcoming them too. We're glad you're here. So um, this is the sanctuary where I've preached my very first sermon. Uh, I don't know if Philippi was here or Barbara, but um, it was a long time ago before I ever imagined ever going to seminary. So I'm so happy to be back um, among you. Um, when I first read this scripture, I kind of groaned inside. It's like, okay, once again, Again, Jesus is telling us to be meek and mild, to be a doormat for Jesus. <laughs> but I think we can learn something else from it. Today is a very special day in my life. Today would be the 108th birthday of my mother. So I'm thinking of her today as I'm here my mother, uh, my father was a principal and organist of a Missouri Synod Lutheran uh, church in Sacramento, California. And it was a downtown church. Somebody else recognizes Missouri Synod Lutheran. <laughs> and, um, and my father was the organist. So we as the family would sit in uh, it was up in the balcony, and we'd sit in folding chairs next to the organ. And my mother, who was the most humble person you can imagine, and tried to do everything right. I mean, she was saintly. She would, during the prayer of confession, turn around, get on her knees, fold her hands, put her head in her hands, and 
plead God to forgive her for all her terrible sins. That's the model of Christian hum humility that I was given. And I don't think it's a very healthy one. I don't think Christ meant for us to grovel. I don't think that's what we're being asked to do in this passage. Um, one of the things that... Um, I'm going to go back and forth. You're, we're going to be very informal today. Good. All right. Um, I think there's something beyond Jesus being a Mr. Manners, even though part of the passage sounds like that. First of all, it's very important to recognize that when Jesus says, take the place, your place, and not the place of honor, that person that he's talking to has a choice of where to sit. And they were invited to the banquet already. They have some agency. This is not, they are not talking to the per people serving the food, the people washing the feet of those who come in. He's not talking to the people left out of the banquet hall. He is only talking to those who have a choice. And as we know, and I know this is a social justice church, so I know we all know we have choices in different ways, depending on our gender, our ethnicity, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, our anything. There are all kinds. Our education is a big one. All kinds of ways that we can have choice. But often, people have very little choice to come to the banquet at all. And that is key in this whole reading. A friend of mine, a very wise friend, told me once that the definition of humility is to be right-sized. To be right-sized. As in the fairy tale, the three bears, not too small, not too large, but just right. Isn't that a better definition of humility? To be right-sized. We conflate um, humility often with um, uh, being humiliated or groveling, as I said in the beginning. But to be right-sized meaning means we stand in who we are, we understand ourselves, and we live authentic authentically and allow other people to live authentically as well. I had a very interesting experience this summer. I was blessed to make up for travel that I didn't get to do in the last two years, and one was to celebrate a wedding anniversary in England. And I went to a play in London, and um, my son, who's um, 37 now, Philippia, <laughs> um, came in late, and they actually let him come in. I was mortified. But anyway, he came down. You know how those old, small theaters are in New York and London. They're, you know, like this, and you come in front of a lot of people. All, so he came down the aisle, almost falling in people's lap. And after a bit, when he got there, he looked down the row, and he said, look who's there. And five seats down from me, or him, was Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, I'm not a fan, 
but somebody who has been so consequential on the world stage, I was like amazed. His size, he took up the same room as the rest of us. <laughs> he only took up one seat. His wife only took up one seat. And yet, the power of that man on the world stage is incredible. For, I think I looked up, he was prime minister a total so far of 15 years. But I, in preparing for today to talk about this scripture, I'm thinking of what might it been like if Netanyahu really believed that Palestinians belonged in the room with him? What would have meant for the world's people if he really, really believed that Palestinians had a place at the table also? That's just a question, but it's how are we right-sized and what does it do? So I said we mix up um, humiliation and humility. So being humble does not mean that we cower, we shrink, we're submissive, but we understand our place in the larger order of things. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing some of these um, photos from the wells um, you call it a telescope, I guess. It's just unbelievable. And it makes me, in some ways, feel very small, but in other ways, right-sized. It gives me perspective as to what size I am and where I belong. You know, humility comes from the same root as humus, the ground, and hum it has the same root as human. And often I worry in churches that we think we're supposed to be perfect rather than right-sized, but also than human. We are nothing more than human with all our flaws and all our wonders and all we are. We are human. And God's call in our life is not to be perfect. It is to be whole. And we grow into wholeness, not perfection. And that's a whole other sermon about what it is. But to be human, to stand in our humanness, is why I think we are in a faith that says that God became flesh. That the human and divine are inextricably linked. When we are right-sized, we are authentic. We're allowed to be authentic because we don't have to pretend. We give space to each other. We are able to have more empathy because we're not jockeying for position. We um, take our successes and failures seriously, but not as a matter of whether we're worthy or not. Now, I'm working on all these things. These, these things, I think, are a lifetime project, don't you? I think they are anyway, at least for me at 71. We are aware of our strengths and limitations and can see the strengths and limitations of others. And in a really wonderful way, to stand in our right size, we can 
transcend ourselves in a bit. So I think there are other gifts of being right-sized. We give others the, the room they need, as I said, but also we can learn more because we're listening to others. We're not threatened by their successes. We, we are enriched because we are open to all, everyone and the world and the earth. We are allowed to grow and become enriched and connect in a very, very deep way. Um, the world view of our, in our culture, in our, in our fast-paced, achieving culture, is I think the world as a ladder that we look at the people above us and we're worried about the people nipping at our heels and if we are um, if we are a little worried we e either have to step on people in front of us if they're going a little too slowly or we're afraid who's behind us but the world Jesus gives to us is the world of a banquet where there's a round table it's ever expanding and there's always always room for each and every one of us may God bless us to be part of this heavenly banquet amen